Hey everybody, welcome to the last IT podcast in the world. I'm David, he's Derek. How you doing, Derek? Doing well. How about you? Good. Spring is in the air for me. Yes. I Opening feel like spring day. has arrived here in Colorado. So no more snow? No, well, that means we have two more snowstorms to go. Probably. Okay, but they're warm snow. <laughs> they'll blow in, they'll dump a bunch of snow, they'll melt in three days. Kill, kill the but, flowers uh, on the trees. Yeah, the branch, exactly. Any fruit you thought. Yeah, if you planted <laughs> your garden too early, you're toast. But yeah, anyway, I've, I've got a skip in my step as I think about coming out of the long winter. So you yeah. guys are probably kind of in summer mode already. Close. We're still, we've got blue bonnets. So I think that's still technically spring in Texas, as long as there are blue bonnets out. The Texas yeah. blue bonnets. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's 80 degrees or so. And I think we're. Does your family drive like five miles to go find a blue bonnet field and take a picture or no? There, there's a lot of, they're, they're so abundant. There's such like the, like Texas wide precautions about mowing blue bonnets. It's not illegal, but it's so frowned upon that. Oh, because they're invasive or because they're protected? Because they're protected. They're, they probably are invasive at some point, but yeah, they're, don't, don't touch them. Those are sacred blue bonnets. I don't see. you dare mow them. Okay. So. Real quickly, I'm wearing the Rockies baseball hat. I'm going to go to home opener on Friday. Never been to a home opener. They're really? already terrible. I figure catch them early while they're terrible. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, like August when they're terrible. Seems like a better game to go to. Get them while they're within five of the division lead or so. Never been to a home opener. That's a big deal. You know, that's awesome. I'd love to do yeah. that sometime. Yep. What's your hat? Uh, Cleveland now guardians. This is before they changed their name. Um, my son's a really good thrifter. He likes going to thrift stores and finding stuff. And he found like a really nice new era 3930 MLB hat for a team that I have no particular like or dislike for, but I like the colors. So good. There you go. Yeah. Very baseball theme, very spring very of us. <laughs> hey, quick follow-up from last time. Uh, we talked about Bucky's, which I haven't been to yet. I came back from a long road trip, by the way. <laughs> Same effect. Like I'm like, I'm not stopping. I got to get home. To home. Yeah, I got gas. I told my wife we could get brisket, and we're like, we're tired. Let's go home. But I anyway, haven't been to brisket. But remind the people, the number one calling card of their business model is? Bathrooms. Clean bathrooms. Which are? Yeah, which I consider a a sign that we're in late stage capitalism and probably declining (laughs) as as a human civilization that we're unable to keep public restrooms clean. But let me tell you why I might be on your side. I, uh, my brother uh, up in Wyoming, hey, at brother up in Wyoming, hope you're listening. I joined him for breakfast. Wyoming, as you know, geography wise, people don't know this, but Wyoming's not far for me. I joined him up in Wyoming at a truck stop for breakfast. I do this once in a while. We meet up there. Okay. And not to, I mean, we don't like, you know, bathroom talk here on the pod, but I had to use the bathroom. (laughs) And let's just say it was uh, on the urgency scale, 6.5 out of 10, 6.5. Okay. You know, it's an hour plus back home. Yeah. I'll use the bathroom. So the, the shortest, politest version of the story is I walked into this truck stop men's bathroom checked out all of the available options one by one and said, I can I wait. <laughs> <laughs> I can and make I, it. Th- I thought of you in Bucky's. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I wish this was a Bucky's, frankly, but anyway. Yep. So. I will drive the 60 miles back and use the Bucky's near my home. <laughs> right. Right. So anyway. All right. Good. Have you, like when I recently had an experience where I was doing remote work in another city and I realized I have a ranking scale, not surprising because I've, <laughs> I've told you before, I'm a ranker on really good places to do remote work. These are businesses that you do remote work. Okay. Um, I know you've got younger kids than I do. Do you ever like sneak away when you're on a trip because you need a place to work or not very much? Not very often. We had a, a couple of years ago, we were remodeling our house and we didn't have the Hmm. wi-fi backup so we could live there but wi-fi wasn't good so we would i did the coffee shop thing i did the hoa clubhouse thing and that was that was fine but yeah i'd rather i'd rather be at home in my office yeah i I figured or or when you are with the fam on vacation you're doing a little bit of work 
maybe it's in the hotel room. The kids are jumping yeah. on the bed behind you. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I might have more opinions on this, but I realized, uh, I went to, I'll just shout out to a, a coffee shop in North, Northern Oklahoma city called Stella Nova. And they rank right up there with one of the best coffee shops I've ever worked in. And I realized I've got criteria. Okay. So the first criteria, and you mentioned it, is like you, you, you have to have a good, strong Wi-Fi game. Mm-hmm. And as IT professionals, we know, you and I know that you can throttle your Wi-Fi. You can make your guest Wi-Fi just barely work, like sipping through a soda straw if you want. Right. That's a bad idea. This they had rocking good. I, I go to a coffee shop. I open up my speed test app. I see what my speeds are. Can I do a video call here, for example? Mm-hmm. And real quickly, I landed this place because I, I tried to go to a pretty cool downtown coffee shop. And it was the downtown coffee shops tend to be small and on these old buildings. And they're always really, it was crowded. I couldn't find a, I couldn't find a table, which brings us to our second thing, like flat surfaces to work mm-hmm. on. So and I'm talking about, I'm going to be there for a couple of hours. This, right. let's, I'm going to be working for a couple of hours. I might take two different phone, uh, two different video calls. I might get bang out a little bit of work. I might do some research. So I'm, I'm there for a little bit of time, two, two and a half hours. That's kind of my criteria. So lots of flat table space or workspace. And this place in Oklahoma City, Stella Nova. By the way, I would be wearing their hat. They had <laughs> merch, but only t-shirts. And so, oh. hey, at... Stella Nova OKC, uh, I'd be wearing your hat right now for the hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of international and national listeners for us. But uh, anyway, Sell some uh, so hats. they had they had a big seating area. You got a lot of Starbucks, and like the like Starbucks footprint is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. And they like to have like the cozy sofa sitting area, which I don't this work place on that. Yeah, I yeah, need no, a it's gotta, you've got to be sitting at a table. And then this is a nuance, but a lot of these really trendy coffee shops will have like a bar height table and Mm -hmm. a chair that's a stool. It's not got a back. So the third thing I like is like a chair with a back. Even if, even if you're at a long surface, this this thing had a really long work surface plus tables Mm -hmm. and a long work surface was not bar height. It was regular height. So they just had a bunch of um, chairs, which brings us to the fourth thing, which is power. Mm, That's a good point. Yeah, lots of accessible outlets, and this place had them kind of at kind of desk level. You didn't have to find them on the floor. Everywhere, lots. It was really thought well through. Like they're like, please come sit here for a couple of hours and work. Lots of power, lots of work surface, good chairs, good Wi-Fi. Um, and then you know, I haven't mentioned coffee yet. I do like above average coffee. I'm. To some, I would be a coffee snob. To my kids, I'm like not even close. They are they totally eclipse <laughs> me. Uh, but I do. I, I'll take a I'll take a C plus if all those other things are in place. And I've got one more thing. C if that's C if it's a C plus coffee B minus, I'm fine with it. Right. The the main thing is to um, it doesn't hurt if I'm going to be there over lunch if they have like a pretty good food offering. But I didn't really grade on that. The final thing I noticed about this place was the. The music and the acoustics, the background music was just low enough to mm. not be intrusive. You go to a lot of places and it's all like just loud and, and kind of in your face music. And I told him this, the poor lady taking my order was like, here's, here's the reasons I like this place. And she was like, I just take coffee <laughs> orders. <laughs> I don't care. You know, I, get paid, I get paid one way or the other. Yeah. So <laughs> actually she was very nice and very enthusiastic. <laughs> so, so all those things factored in. I think that's my complete list. Um, but even the music was at the right background level. Yeah. Um, if you were meeting someone in person there, but certainly on a call, it wouldn't get in the way. Of course, you should use headphones in a place like that. But good acoustics, all that stuff. Pretty good coffee. They, I'll just say it's good coffee. It was excellent coffee. So anyway, good. things to look for. Well, good job at my, Stella Nova uh, OKC. My personal image consultant we worked in the hospitality industry and – there's a lot of strategy behind how you play music, right? And do you want people to get in and get out? You'll play a more aggressive, irritating music to move people through. So yeah, you can tell what they're going for, right? Yeah. Stella Nova was like, come stay a while. Come stay and a I while. appreciated that quite a bit. So anyway, that's our ranking of how to make uh, me be. And so like, I'm going to go there every time. Real quickly, the reason I was there is this time we were staying with family in their house which almost never works for remote work. Yeah. 
uh, people get up at different times. You know, people are clattering around getting their coffee or whatever in the morning, or, you know, depending on the time of day. And there's not really most, most places where I've got family, they don't have like a dedicated room where you can just go close the door. You're kind of in the flow. Yeah. So that, that's the reason I was looking for a place. And I went there three days in a row and it was excellent. So yeah. And they're, they're not kicking out the door. Like some places are like turning down, the, <laughs> turning down the AC, turning up the music. Yep. Anyway. Good stuff. I would add, I think not, I don't do it a lot, but there's a sweet spot of traffic where too crowded and you feel in the way the whole time. But if you're the only person there and it's just you and the staff for a long period of time, kind of an uncomfortable vibe. Right. So I think right. where there's a, the right mix of on the, That's the right. Very nuanced. The water, not nobody, but not everybody. Yeah. 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 Good point. All right. Tips for remote work. And if you're ever in Edmond or North Oklahoma city, uh, stop by our good friends at Stella Nova. This is not a paid advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, time for the next segment. We'll be right back after this short break. Hey everybody. And welcome back to the last it podcast in the world. Uh, we're going to talk about an interesting concept in IT that some people I'm sure have heard about, other people may have not, called technical debt. A super critical concept to run a, a good IT department. And, and it com- comes from a headline in the Wall Street Journal titled that says, The Invisible $1.52 Trillion Problem, Clunky Old Software, from mm-hmm. March 1st, 2024, talking about technical debt. I encourage you to go read that. It's a really good one. Um, and Derek, you've got to just read the the one the selected paragraph from the article that'll get us started talking about this. Yeah, this paragraph. Technical debt is one of those invisible issues that people either know they have a problem with or they don't know, and that's worse. Says Roger Williams, a vice president at, of research at Gartner. It happens because it's cheaper and easier to put things off for tomorrow, just like anything we have at home. That last sense is super critical. That's exactly right. Yeah, let's let's make this easy for people who maybe not as IT centric as we are. We do have a few of those listeners. So, technical debt is the price you will pay in the future for doing things poorly, cheaply, quickly, or inefficiently today. You want to add anything to that? Yeah. There's probably some room to I think the I think the great thing with the technical debt, the debt analogy is that like personal debt, it's not all bad, it's not always bad. But it has a cost. So debt to buy a home, mm. fairly low interest rate. You probably couldn't do it otherwise. Totally reasonable. You know, buying furniture on credit, not as good. Carrying credit card debt, you know, high interest rate, not for really a good reason, just because you're not managing Using it to essentially live on and yeah, function. Exactly. That's That's yeah. when you have a problem. You're having... You know, debt strategic. Sometimes it's a good strategy, but you do need to pay attention to what what you're acquiring debt for, and and then pay down debt that you shouldn't have or need to get get past. Yeah, and technical debt is tied to. So so let's let me go back. Uh, you're you're a, you're a country boy, farm boy. Does the do you remember the phrase bubble gum and bailing wire? Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah, I've heard uh, duct tape and bailing wire is another permutation. But yeah, what it indicates is when you do a repair without maybe the proper tools to do the repair. Right. And it's like, yep, I, I fixed that plumbing leak or whatever with bubble gum and bailing wire, or in your case, duct right. tape and bailing wire. Yeah. And the analogy would be like, if your home water heater sprung a leak and you, what's the, I don't know what the product is that you slap on, <laughs> like slap on the water seal. Flex, flex seal. Thank you. Flex yes. seal. If you just like took it and was like, you know what? I, I saw just the commercial. I'll just fix it. On there. If you slapped on flex seal, you started accumulating water heater debt. Mm-hmm. Because you have not addressed the main you have problem. You've not fixed the main problem. It might have been quick the right and, quick and dirty. Yeah, comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. And in technical land, there's lots of times you're there are moments you, you're starting to accrue negative technical debt or technical debt that's not good. Technical right. debt is always bad as, as opposed to consumer debt. Um, right. And we can talk about some of the ways, but the headline gave it away. Old clunky software is one. Yeah. Um. Go go ahead. No, I think the ahead. article talks about like, you know, banking software and being on COBOL that no one learns anymore. And it's, you know, your 
you have a maintenance problem. If there's a problem, there's a few people who can fix it. You're also missing out on 50 years of technology growth. And you're wondering why we can't have this new feature that somebody else has. It's because you're on this anachronistic platform that's making everything that you do harder and harder and slower, or sometimes just not possible. Yeah. And, and for those that don't know, this article mentions ADP and COBOL in the same breath. ADP, the very, very large, well-known payroll processor and COBOL. I don't know if they meant to connect them, but COBOL, if you don't know, is an ancient programming language. It is not in use anymore. Nobody's teaching it at school, but that doesn't mean it's not, I mean, it's in use, but it's not, it's not new development. And if you're running those old things, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I'll tell you, you know, if you're running an ERP system that's like, I don't know, seven or eight releases behind and you're running on premise, meaning on your servers, that's a really good example of technical debt because Mm -hmm. the lift to move that now onto a modern cloud platform and have it be freed from servers and to have new functionality is, would be, you know, quite, quite the project. Whereas maybe if you've been keeping up the, the longer, the older your software is, the system you're running, the more difficult it's going to be to move to the modern version of whatever you want to do. But like st- keeping on an old platform for too long is, is accumulating technical debt. Yep. Absolutely. Do you have examples? You're in the developer architect land. You know, are there are there examples more from the de- development side of things that come to mind? Yeah, or- and there. Um, similarly, there's a couple different ways you accumulate it. One is, like we talked about, you do it bad the first time. You didn't understand what needed to happen, or you had maybe you had some more junior developers do a project, and it works, and it got out the door, and people started using it, but maybe it's really hard to debug. It's really, it's really fragile. Like one thing may doesn't have unit tests on it. So every time you fix a bug somewhere like the flex seal example, another leak springs because it's, it's complicated. It's not easy to read. It's fragile, brittle code. Again, it works. It does the feature that's needed, but change to it is risky and brittle. It's hard to add functionality to it. That's, that's a big case of technical debt. Mm -hmm. Um, like we alluded to being on older platforms where you're missing out on years of, you know, human capital output of, you know, new tools, new plugins, new, new patches and fixes that are just unavailable to you because you've, you've stayed on this older platform. And so when there's a new feature out and you want it and your management wants it for you, you can't just implement that feature or bring in that toolkit. Or like you said, move to a cloud environment You've got for before you do any of that, you've got to do this lift to get onto a new platform, to a new you know, new operating system, new new whatever, and new framework, and you can't really move forward until any of that's there. And in your business, you've got competitors that are delivering features because of those new new platforms, and you can't touch them. Yeah, and over in in IT support land, or when things break and you fix them. Uh, a lot of times when something pretty big has broken on a system or you've got a bug or business has stopped because there's something going wrong, I mean, people dive in to research that and fix it. Often they come up with a workaround. Well, I just did this quick thing and it seems to work, but maybe it's not stable to your point or mm-hmm. we have to like reset it every 24 hours for I'm making this up. But too often in IT space, we're guilty of living being satisfied with the workaround instead of the solid fix. Right. Like I, I know that made it work, but it's not, it's still not stable. And we maybe need to dig deeper because there's so many things flying at typical modern IT departments, man, if you've got a workaround and it's working ish or mm-hmm. kind of breaks a lot, but it breaks less often, you're under the other fire. And, and right. again, they talk about this in the article about there's so much being thrown at IT that they never have time to go like shore up, the core systems that are maybe limping along and accumulating technical debt because right. we're understaffed. There's two, there's projects being thrown at people like we, you know, Hey, marketing went out and bought new software. Really? IT didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Okay. But when can you have it integrated with our, whatever fill, you know, e-commerce platform. Um, so there's so much sort of like 
things coming at them, sometimes through no governance or approval process that you can't kind of stabilize your core, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's, it's a very unappealing project in terms of, it's like, we've talked about that before, I think with home maintenance of, you know, if there's something fun you want to do for your house and remodel the kitchen and that'd be really great. But it turns out you have to spend $5,000 fixing an air conditioner or more fixing an air conditioner or water heater just to get back to the status quo. It's, it's, it's not, not sexy. Fun. It's not sexy. Nope. It doesn't, it's hard to go sell somebody on that of, Hey, this still kind of works, but we probably should upgrade it. But, it, and if, when, when it's all done, it'll be just like it was before, but it won't break in the future, but it hasn't broken yet or it hasn't broken off and yet. Yeah. I was having uh, I was having breakfast the other day with someone in the IT space in the airline industry. Hmm. And we were reminiscing back to the Southwest catastrophe. What was that a year and a half ago around the holidays? Yeah. yeah. Where the, literally the perfect storm lined up and what it exposed when you read the articles was old, fragile systems, which had not been updated in years. And what you found out was things like pilots and crews can't update their own status directly on an app. They have to call a call center and say, hey, can you, you know, just these terrible things. And so my point is like that Southwest incident was literally the poster child for technical debt. Absolutely. It, nobody heard anything about their systems until they did. Right. The debt was accruing for 20, 15, 10, 15, 20 years. And then everything broke. And now they've got a disaster on their hands. Now, your disaster may not make the news, dear listener. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but, it, but if you're doing things on the cheap, so on the cheap is number one, in my opinion. Like, yeah. Always the cheapest solution. Can we do it for free? Can we get the lowest cost? You know, is IT, like I said, I'd like to drive the IT cost down to zero, said some uninformed CFO or CEO. <laughs> like, okay, but we're going to be accumulating technical debt, right? Right. Um, not staffing properly so that you can go deal with things that are old and creaky and breaking and like re-engineer them. I know it's a water heater repair project. But, you know, it's better than being without hot water for 10 days in a row. Yeah. You know, the, the staffing, don't get me started on that. Like most IT departments are staffed like a fire department only that's always putting out fires. Yep. And so just fixing and, and modernizing things um, for sure is a problem. Another one is like letting every department go buy their own software and then throwing it over the wall to IT creates a different kind of technical debt, lack of integration, the debt of standalone siloed systems is a form of technical debt. Yep. Where now you've got, no, you know, nothing talks to each other. So you've got people manually typing in things because you didn't have a process for picking systems and bringing them into your architecture and your ecosystem in a structured way. It's just sort of like hurting cats. Don't yep. do it. Like <laughs> rain people in on that. Um, and again, the workaround scenario, when things break, just kind of patching, patching, bubble gum, bailing wire, duct tape, right. flex seal, you know. Um, there was, a, this reminds me, long, long, long ago in my career, so long ago, I won't be offending anyone. There was, an, there, was a, there was a plant engineer at a company I worked at, and he had an old, like really old, like 60s era Ford Falcon. And he was, a, he was kind of a miser. He was saving every penny he could for, I don't know what, <laughs> but it was, he wasn't spinning out on cars and he showed me his car once and the car burned oil so badly that he had constructed a way that he could add oil into a funnel while he drove. <laughs> so there was a, there was a funnel on the dashboard <laughs> that ran to a rubber, a plastic hose that went into the oil filling area of the engine. And he just had several bottles in the seat. And by the way, this won't surprise you, but I don't think hardly anyone ever sat in his passenger seat. If that makes, if you can connect the dots of yeah. what I'm saying here. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> so he had plenty of room to store motor oil. Well, there's so much and responsibility he, that goes with being a passenger. In that yeah. Car. You know, like, I don't think I want to ride with you if I have to also <laughs> like be your pit stop person. And he would just add a quart of oil as he drove. That's how much oil it burned. It couldn't even wait for him to. <laughs> not, so not that a quart car, before you start the trip. That car was the physical manifestation of IT technical debt. That's a great, great example. Yeah, 
overhaul the engine. If you want to keep your Ford Falcon or whatever that thing was, yeah, like overhaul the engine, right? You know, but no, no, I'll just, and he he like drilled a hole through his dash and you know moved some wires out of the way. I'm sure it was elegant. So anyway, yeah, that what I just described is what is happening in IT departments across our country, and we mentioned a lot of the reasons for it. But you know, the the thing I'd go back and say is this headline, you know, says the invisible one point foot five two trillion dollar problem some guy did a calculation probably on the back of a napkin maybe not maybe more sophisticated than that and my question to 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 people listening is like what's your share of that yeah what's your share of the 1.52 trillion it's probably not a billion or a million but it's probably a number which is costing your company in productivity in automation in taking advantage of the latest features that are available on a mm-hmm. modern platform of not having to manually key in things between systems, as we learned about in my car experience in the last <laughs> stack size uh, episode. So many good examples. But if your systems are old or patched with fixes that are, or I should have added this highly customized off the shelf mm-hmm. software. If you can't yep. upgrade because you've customized your ERP or your marketing solution so much that it's non upgradable. Heaps and piles of debt is what you have, technical debt. Yep. And I'll add, if you have custom software or customized software and you want to make changes to it and your development team says, let's not touch that area, that's a, that's a, they're probably right, but that's probably a a flashing yellow sign, right? That this, this is, this is a hair's breadth from being irrevocably broken. (laughs) That is a great point. I have heard similar in the last year or two where someone says this part we have bandaged and coded over so many times that I, I, nobody can even understand it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're afraid if we change one thing, it'll break everything. Mm -hmm. Like you said, that's a marker. Yeah. That's a marker that you have painted yourself slowly and understandably because we're all human beings here into a corner and there are ways out of it. You, You need, you need people like smart people like Derek, smart people like me. <laughs> we don't really work together, but we could. Um, you, you need the right people to come in and help you engineer your way out of those situations. There, There is hope for that. I, that's the point, I guess, is like, yeah. it takes will and it takes a plan and you have to know really clearly what's first, second, and third and what not to touch till you do A, B, or C before. Yep. Uh, but um, I guess the old overused metaphor is if you find yourself in a hole, Derek, you should stop digging. Exactly. If you find yourself in technical debt, start digging your way out of it. It doesn't really work as a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> start paying uh, it out. Start paying it off. Awesome. I guess that brings us to what what did you what did you learn today? Once again we have David's ranking, but I learned some really good coffee shop ranking ranking systems and I I think I largely agree with that. That's it. Yeah, I, I you I learned I learned that your son is a thrift shopper. I I'm intrigued. Like you know that <laughs> yeah he's, that, he's, he's made a, some he, money flipping shoes from thrift stores i did not know that that's yeah. fascinating yeah oh and that uh it's that, that it's blue bonnet it's, it's blue, blue bonnet, bonnet season i learned that you're enjoying the blue bonnets and that there's restrictions about mowing them i guess mm-hmm. good well pleasure as always derek uh talk to you next time as as well to our listeners thanks everybody see you next time on the last it podcast in the world 